So now I would have the honor of introducing our speaker for today. David Rare is um, a visiting professor this semester and teaching uh, historical demography to graduate students in the department. We're just delighted to have him as a guest all semester. Um, David is a historian uh, who has spent his career in Spain. And my uh, his, most of his work has been uh, working on uh, small scale, very careful, demographic, uh, historical work in Spain. But his fame, beyond that, is for his big pictures that he's given us over the years. And I'm sure many of you have read his, uh, his essay in Provision Development Review on uh, family systems. And today, he's promising us another big picture look, uh, not just across space, but over time. So uh, thank you, David. It's wonderful to have you looking at the long, long, long durée and the big spaces. So we look forward to engaging with you all hour and beyond. Well, um, uh, thanks, Josh. It's a pleasure to be here. It's an honor to be in the presence of many of you whom I've known for years. Uh, the history department has made a, a last ditch heavy duty participation here. <laughs> Dave here. We have Jan de Vries. We have uh, other wonderful demographers. And um, I'm going to try and give you a, a um, OK, let me, um, here, here's the outline. But the important part of the outline is probably for the first time this year, you're going to get a handout. Um, and I've got that. I will give it at the due moment for the handout for everyone. Uh, it will be basically so we don't have to get bogged down in details. It will also be a bit of a different sort of presentation because I have very little empirical data to show you. Uh, just a minimum. It's basically, uh, it's work in progress of how I'm trying to get my head around what I consider is a major issue for uh, developed countries, which is the um, a ongoing and persistent differentials in fertility uh, in the developed world, which has been going on for quite a while. And I hope to show you that it's been going on for longer than you might think. And I would like to try and think through how we can look at that and how we can maybe try and find an explanation for that. Anyway, that's the whole think point of the uh, uh, of the presentation. The, the, uh, the low fertility, this persistently low fertility, there are three explanations floating out there about the reasons for the low fertility. One of the explanations, we were fortunate enough to have Fran Goldscheider here in February who gave, it, gave us that explanation, which was in terms of the, what she calls the gender revolution. But we also get Ron Lestaga who talks to us uh, on and on and on about the second demographic transition, which would be another reason uh, for these persistent differentials. And then certainly we won't, don't want to forget the work of Joshka Sping-Anderson about welfare regimes and the Nordic welfare regimes as being the key to higher fertility in Nordic countries, etc., etc., etc. Those are the basic reasons that are floating out there for uh, to explain the fertility differentials we can observe in Europe in the 1990s and in the 2000s, etc., etc., etc. I would like to propose that all of those are part of the story, but they're only a, perhaps a small part of the story because they are, it's a type of reasoning that is based very much on the immediate events that have been taking care, place in Europe and in the developed world in, in the very recent past. And I think there are other reasons. In other words, I think those reasons, I certainly don't want to discount those reasons, but I would like to say that they fit within a larger, a larger framework. Uh, um, this is an important issue uh, for all of us in the developed world who are facing rapidly aging societies and the potential implications that aging in different parts of the developed world will be, will look like, you know? And so it's very important and perhaps we could benefit from a new sort of perspective. And so that takes me back to the legacy of the demographic transition. 
because I believe that the demographic transition set in 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 set got going what has led us to these differentials we will we will look at before before the demographic transition population homeostasis or or population equilibriums or demographic regimes were based in a kind of a non-technical way on three very important um, stills. That's where their stability came from. Uh, number one was the ongoing importance of mortality for re reproductive decision making in the past. Uh, number two was the reality of subsistence economies and the links between economies and um, economic fluctuations and population trends, uh, as well as the role the family played uh, substituting for what the state does normally today uh, in terms of uh, providing welfare uh, for its members. And then finally, there were solid cultural and social constraints on reproduction that were not questioned, and they are all questioned nowadays. And so those are the way, the reasons that, that we get this fairly stable uh, demographic regime over the past. I believe that the big issue, the news here, the first part of the news is one of the implications of the demographic transition that we never had, most people writing about it did not consider in the past, was the disappearance of mortality, of, infant, of childhood mortality as a basic constraint on people's reproductive uh, decisions. And what happens with the demographic transition is infant mortality ends up becoming, or childhood mortality ends up becoming a purely residual factor for people's reproductive decisions. People in the past, wherever you were, considered that they were going to lose one, two, three, whatever many children, and they would then they would set their fertility goals because nobody wanted to be without children. They would set their fertility goals at a level that would be enough to compensate for those children they were going to lose. Well, it turns out, one of, by implication of the demographic transition, women today who are going to have children do not consider mortality uh, at all. In other words, if, more, if something happens to a child of yours, it's an accident. It is not something you expect. So when people, when modern day people set their, set their, their reproductive goals up, they don't keep in mind uh, what's going to happen uh, to the health of their children. I think that's a game changer. That's a real game changer because what it means is you, 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 you get rid of mortality as a primary cause of, 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 of reproduction and so it falls into the realm of individual choice. Individual choice. Now there are all kinds of other things that happen. <clears throat> At the same time there's a cultural revolution that goes on. We get we get the, the pill, we get all kinds of things that go on and help facilitate this, but basically what happens is the decision to have children, which was very much of a social one before, it was constrained by norms in society, it was demanded by mortality, all of a sudden comes out, it's like a wave has broken, and they're on the shores of individual choice. And that's what happens to reproductive uh, decisions nowadays. And I think that is a um, that requires a different sort of perspective that we cannot just look at that to explain it from a very present day perspective okay <clears throat> if we um, uh, we cannot look at the post transitional uh, uh, fertility situation uh, until we have control for that effect of the demographic transition many times when I was writing a um, um, myself included, I said, this has escaped the notice of many researchers. I wrote a paper with Jan van Babel about the baby boom, we published in PDR a few years ago, and it never even occurred to us that what was happening during the baby boom, um, we had all kinds of much higher fertility in southern Europe during the baby boom, uh, but there was no way it participated in the boom as we measured it, but it never occurred to us that maybe that was because mortality was still a relevant variable for fertility. In, in many parts of, of southern Europe, as late as 1940, 1950, even 1960. And so it obscured to our vision the possibility that there are long-term continuities here. 
And I think there are. And it may not be just a matter of timing of trend changes. So what I propose here, and this is my only empirical uh, thing I'm going to show you today, is if we control for that moment in which childhood mortality becomes irrelevant, uh, we will be able to look at, in a kind of a pure sense, where the pervading fertility levels are going. And so I proposed a, 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 a figure that you're going to see down below <coughs> that, that I measure baby boom fertility as a nine-year average after, in every different society, after infant mortality goes below 50 per thousand. That's a purely arbitrary threshold. I could have used 40 per thousand, I could have used 30 per thousand, 60 per thousand, but it, it enabled me to put a timer on that. And, and you find out that in the developed countries of the world, you get societies that go beneath that threshold as early as 1920, and other societies that go beneath that threshold as late as 1970. So you get a whole different, they go below those at different times. Anyway, I attempted to do that, and then I, on the graph, I also showed an average, it's also an arbitrary thing, an average of, of being total fertility rates for the 1995-2005 period, basically the baby bust, right, uh, to look at it. And here's what you get. Oh, you get cell range doesn't work. Well, that's, that, that I mean, I can say anything here. You, nobody, <laughs> no, no, nobody can dispute me. That's because I changed over to the... In infidel here at Mac, uh, had, I, had I put, no, I don't want to take the time to do that, but I, I, could, I have a PDF of the same thing. But what you get here, let me give you an idea. What you get here is you can imagine all of here you get the United States, New Zealand, um, uh, Australia, Canada, you also get Iceland. Can you you get, before we... Okay, okay, here we get the um, TFRs. For 1995 to 2005, okay, this would be what we call the baby bust fertility, and here is the baby boom fertility, which goes on from two to about four. These are total fertility rates in both periods, okay? And so what you're doing is you're situating. So when you get the countries out there in the upper right-hand part, these are countries where um, uh, baby boom fertility is very high, and baby bust fertility is relatively and down here in the lower left-hand corner, where you, where you get the usual suspects of Bulgaria and Romania and Italy and Spain and Portugal and Greece and are all countries where the baby bust has been very, very strong and where the baby boom was comparatively lower. Okay. You also get some countries, which I know you're going to talk about, Josh, which I don't have any ready explanation for because here I think you have Germany and here you have Switzerland, and here you have Austria, which don't fit my global thing, but, but I'm, I'm very sorry that I, I didn't realize that that would not come up. I, anyway, so you get... And David, where, where does the IMR constraint come in? Okay, the IMR constraint <coughs> means that for the date of the baby boom fertility, what I've done is I've only taken a date after in that society we have indication from the human mortality database and the ENED databases that fertility has gone below 50 per thousand. So when I say if 50, if fertil, not fertility, if infant mortality, if infant mortality goes below 50 per thousand, say in 1950, 55, then I will use fertility estimates for that society after that date. Okay. So which means it's, it's I'm, I'm playing with the data here because it's not all the same date, but you wouldn't see this if you didn't, if you didn't do that. So, I, I uh, that's what I did. All right? Who's in the third circle? Pardon me? There's a third circle there. Okay, the third circle is in the middle. The third circle is UK, you get France, you get Norway, I, Norway is here, which is not completely far out, but it's not down here either. So it's, I, I did that because you do seem to have three kind of, kind of circles, these being certainly predominantly the, the non-European Anglo-Saxon uh, English-speaking countries, these being Northern Europe, although, would you like me to? No, that's all right. No, this is, better. This is even better. We can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> Without thinking of exceptions. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I will be glad to send this to you. I, this is embarrassing, actually. 
anyway, you get basically that you get the what 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 we've been observing in Europe now of high fertility, relatively high fertility in northern and western European countries and low fertility in southern and eastern European countries is all I'm saying is that that also appears to have been the case in the 1950s. That's my main point. In other words, when we're looking at these patterns, these aren't recent things. Can, could we see these from an earlier date? Uh, actually, I don't I don't know, because what happens is fertility would then would be very much obscured by the weight of mortality in society. Although the argument I'm going to put forth is that, yes, there are things that are conditioning that, that go way in the past. However, I think just from the fact that we can use the 1950, 2010 uh, period, which is a fairly long period, as something of a historical continuity, it certainly warrants uh, in, it, it warrants a new look. And I think the standard explanations for fertility differences are just too anchored in the present. And that's, for me, they are not totally convincing. So what I've done is I propose an explanation. Okay? The, and my explanation is based on the fact that in some societies, it is just easier to have kids and families than it is in others. And that young people perceive those differences. And they perceive those challenges. And it's just something normal. And I've been, I, I, I live in the States often. I also live in a Southern European country. And it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting. Here, people, it's a natural thing. It's considered a natural thing to have kids. There, it's a heroic thing to have kids. Especially if you want to have a profession, you know, and so that's 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 kind of what I'm getting at, and so I I want to look at that, and so my point of departure is that individual choice is the key for measuring post-transitional fertility levels. Individual choice is a key uh, variable you have to keep in mind. People make decisions on their own; they are no longer dictated by society to do this. There's no longer a need to make family welfare for your parents because there are welfare systems that exist. It is purely a matter of individual choice, but it's individual choice that is then mediated by the society. In other words, the society itself creates a context in which the individual choice is either facilitated or it's made more difficult. And that is my basic argument. And I think society should not be understood in other words, what I'm saying is, if we did a model, if we could model this, we would, we would say, we want individual and group characteristics, like demographers do so well, certainly it's impinging on behavior, but all of those take place in a, in a playing field, which is a playing field that is dictated by society, by the type of society people live in, and that's what creates the fact that you get, you get variation in one, one country here, and in another country it's up there, and in another country it's down here. You, in other words, you have all the individual determinants, but they take place within a context. It's what I call the playing field, so to speak. Uh, and this has a big influence on people's decisions. Now, if we look at this, now, if you don't mind, I will give you a handout. This is the handout. The reason the handout exists is so we don't have to take a lot of time uh, to go through it, because it is rather long and rather involved. But the argument I want to make is the following. If you look at the geography of, of fertility in, in, um, in, in, in the developed world, which I, I showed imperfectly before because I had a lot of cell range in that, but, but at least more or less, maybe actually you could read the countries because it's on a map, and since I don't use map, well, I can't read the countries. Do you think that's possible? Maybe not. Anyway. Uh, that notwithstanding, it's very interesting that you see the map, the distribution of countries goes almost perfectly along the lines of what we would call strong and weak family systems in Europe. And that's where I want to take, to take my explanation back to. Now the difference between strong and weak family areas of Europe in terms of social characteristics is that in weak family areas of Europe you get very much individualistic societies. The values attributed to individualism, to individual choice, to individual prerogatives 
is very, very high. Whereas in familistic societies, where uh, you get the individual, of course, is important, but he's less, he or she is less important than the family group. The individual is seen within the context of the family group, not within the context of the person himself. Now, there, there's a lot of literature about this in Europe that shows that this division of individualistic societies as opposed to familistic societies goes way back in history. I think there is a, there is a, um, a, there are, there's fairly convincing proof that at least since the 18th century it's existed, and my suspicion that it may have existed actually a long time before that, where you get certain ways of, of behaving. You can see this in a very non-scientific way, like I said, if you live in both parts. You, if you're, if you're a good social observer, you pick up on it immediately. Uh, uh, everything in the United States is, a, consult, is a, a cult of the individual and of individual choice. Nothing in Italy is the cult of an individual individual choice. That's not done in Italy. It has to do with families, it has to do with family networks, etc., etc., etc. And I think that's a good way to, to start. This entails different types of societies, and that's what I've attempted to do in this um, uh, this handout, and that matters for family and reproduction. Yeah. This is the yes, Ken. Could you give us a few more tokens of these two classes of societies so we can put places on the categories? You Why don't we do it with this handout? I think this will help. No, but uh, so it's Germany. Okay, okay. In my old Germany. wonderful explanation, Germany doesn't fit. Okay. And, so, and no, but one of the reasons I'm, 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 I'm giving this presentation, apart from the fact I should, is because I'm hoping to get input from you folks about this. It, 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 but give us some cases of... Okay, the, the case, the that. very classical, the classical weak families part of Europe is, is the, uh, um, from northern France up, includes Belgium, includes Holland, includes northern Germany, it includes all of the Scandinavian countries, it includes, it includes the UK, it naturally includes the United States, Canada, Australia. These are what we would call weak family societies. And there are all kinds of variables you can look at to see that. For example, you can look at suicide rates. So this is the Protestant versus the Catholic. Very much Protestant, although you will see Ireland fits much more closely to the British Isles in behavior and in characteristics than it does. And then you get also uh, you get Protestant areas. In other words, it's not a pure fit, but but generally, I this was all in a, a paper I wrote like 25 years ago, and um, uh, <coughs> subsequent research has shown that in Eastern Europe, there the pattern is not identical to Southern Europe, but it's it's actually fairly similar to Southern Europe, and there are long-standing traditions of of um, of familistic societies there. Okay. Have the geography. That's your geography. In other words, south and east as opposed to north and west, basically. With, of course, the great outliers, which are us, uh, standing around there. So anyway, you, you look at this, and what I've done in this um, thing is you have a series of what I consider a social characteristics which are important, taken as a whole, for people's fertility decisions, and how societies that are individualistic or familistic tend, how it tends to be, how those different indicators tend to play out. And so you see things like the pace and intensity of the demographic transition. In individualistic societies, it's early and it's complete. Uh, whereas in, in uh, familistic societies, it was much delayed and took a lot longer to complete. Uh, now, how can you explain that in terms of individualism? Well, I don't want to get in, because if I get involved, then that will be here for hours. But basically, if you, if, you, uh, if you want to do that, why does mortality come down earlier in individualistic societies? Well, I find a very clear explanation. It comes down because parents feel personally responsible for what happens to their children. Whereas in, in, in Southern Europe, parents did not feel personally responsible. The family was responsible, it was a work of God, there was another problem involved. Somebody else was responsible, whereas the assu assuming individual responsibility, I think, is one of the pathways to earlier 
limitation of childhood mortality and things like that. In other words, but I could go on and go on and on with these things. We've got, okay, those are, that, that's largely demographic, but you've got here aspects of civil society. For example, the civil society in individualistic parts of Europe is very strong and very pervasive. I remind, I will recall for all of you the famous work, Bowling Alone, <laughs> about American civil society, very much, very strong, absolutely absent in, in the strong family areas of Europe. There you get a very weak civil society. What you get is very strong family society. Uh, uh, or, or, for example, <clears throat> whatever. The importance of cultural and social constraints on individual behavior. You find that's very weak, very limited in individualistic areas, and it's actually very strong. What will my family think if I don't do this? Okay, you get that very much in, in other parts of the world. You get religion. Here we have religion, Ken, Protestantism and Catholicism. Uh, uh, the pace of secularization, the pace of secularization was very early in the individualistic countries of the world. Very early. In Sweden it's in the 1920s. And in the United States it starts very early, yet there's an important part of maintaining the importance of individual faith in those societies. Whereas in the southern part of Europe, it's very recent, the pace of secularization, but yet it's been breakneck pace of secularization to such an extent that you find that young um, Spaniards in, in when they go mountain hiking what they want to do is when their little monuments to the Virgin Mary or a little cross on top of the hill they want to deface them and destroy them where you would never get that happening in North you know it's a it's a sort of a it's a very different sort of thing uh, uh, the way the way it goes on education the role of women in society I think is very important traditionally the role of women in individualistic societies in Europe was far more relevant than the role of men. I'm not saying it was as relevant as the role of men. I think, I think you get much more anti-clericalism in some of your... Absolutely. Right. And I think that has to do yeah, with the... To the 19th century. I, but I think, I know, and I think that's one of the reasons is that the links of religious institutions, uh, Catholic Church, to power, to the elites, to government, are very strong in fatalistic parts of Europe and very weak in other parts of in other parts of Europe. Anyway, we go on and on. Job stability, wealth, a governance. Basically, in individualistic uh, parts of we get crazy Republican candidates for president, don't we, in the United States? Uh, but basic people basically believe in the system. They believe the system is going to yield us a workable president. They, we believe in the governance of society. And that doesn't make us fools. We share that with the Swedes, we share it with the Finns, we share it with the Brits. That is something we believe in. Basically, in the, in the strong family areas of Europe, people do not believe in governance or in society or in the fact that public officials are not universally corrupt. I could have put, where do you pay taxes willingly? Well, no place you pay taxes willingly. You know, but basically, you pay taxes in the individualistic societies in Europe. Whereas nobody pays taxes if they can get away with it in the... In the so it's, it's a whole kind of a breakdown of the system. And I want to make an argument that the way the system works is a way that gives you confidence when you decide to have children or not. Anyway, values and beliefs, confidence in institutions. There are all kinds of value surveys going around in Europe that talk about these things. Merit-based promotion. Yeah, merit -based, it's meritocracy here with exceptions. In strong family areas of Europe, it's who you know and mostly who your family knows. How you get how you get promotion. It's a, it's a different sort of a thing. We could talk about a level playing field. You get a level playing field here and a, a playing field that is not perceived as level in those countries. This is a very um, um, scary one, too. When you talk with the young Americans, they talk about the risks, they know the risks involved in life, they want to be able to take risks, they want to meet the challenge, they believe that they're able to do this and that and do this and that. When you talk to young folks in Southern Europe, the most universal attitude among them is risk aversion. How can I lower the risks inherent in making life choices? Anyway, 
So these are the basic characteristics. We could go on for hours and hours and talk about this. I would prefer not to because um, I would like to get your input later on. Uh, these have been so a long time, been around for a long time, and clearly in certain parts of the world, uh, it, there are societies that are perceived to be more friendly to having children than others, more conducive to having children than others. And I believe that being conducive is based on all of those variables. Uh, and in others, they're not. Change, of course, is ubiquitous in all systems, and that's very important. But there is still very little indication that those divergences in Europe are changing. They're changing, but they're not diminishing the disparities. So what you get, I, I kind of did a summary hit list here for the type of society that is more prone to having higher levels of fertility and family formation as opposed to the types of societies that are less prone to or having children. And I believe that these make for important things. And if you, I, if, I'm not going to go down the different aspects, but I think it's, it, it comes right out at you. Individual self-confidence, whereas you get very little individual self-confidence in familistic societies. People don't believe society is made for people like that. So they prefer to depend on their family uh, to, to protect them, to help them. They're on, on their contacts. Or, or low self-confidence, risk-taking as opposed to risk aversion, uh, a complete gender revolution, at least in certain segments of individualistic societies. We get a very, very incomplete gender revolution. There's an entire crisis of relationships between couples going on in Southern Europe, which is actually a tragedy. It's like they don't, they, they don't know what to do. Guys don't know what to do and gals don't know what to do either. And so most people don't get together. You get extremely high ages at marriage. Uh, you get extremely high, right now the levels of childlessness in, in the most recent Finnish cohort in Spain is close to 25%, far higher than it is in the States, than it ever has been in the States. Uh, there's a whole big, so th these, these relationships are, are, are not functioning well. All kinds of other things. A, which I think help us understand what's going on. Now, uh, is there going to be, if we look to the future, will there be convergence or divergence in this, um, in this, uh, this pattern? I think there will be increases. Okay, I'll go out on a limb. I think there will be increases in fertility in Southern and Eastern Europe in, in the more or less near future. Basically, because a lot of the newness of these social changes that have gone on in, in, in Europe, for example, the uh, social change is very recent in Southern Europe. It's very traditional in Northern Europe, right? It's been going on for a long time in, no in Northern Europe. It's a fairly recent phenomenon. That recent aspect of much of this change will wear off. That eventually gender roles will sort themselves back out again. And so I, I do think there is some indication that we are going to uh, look at increasing fertility in the um, medium future, at least, uh, in Southern Europe. But I rather doubt that it will be enough to erase the basic differences, because those differences are very much ingrained in the way people look at society and the way they live society. Um, uh, the last PAA, Hans Peter Kohler, I, some of you may have been in the session, gave a, a really interesting, daring presentation in which he talked about three scenarios in, in, uh, in, in Europe, uh, which were the, um, uh, the one scenario was the northern and western, the other was the southern and eastern, and the final scenario was the Germanic scenario. But he talked about the fact that these scenarios may be instead of diminishing the disparities in Europe, might exaggerate the disparities in Europe because what they will do is they will condition the types of migration countries uh, uh, experience, it will condition the type of aging process that different countries experience, it, it, they could become self-reinforcing, and he gave a very pessimistic position, more or less about the fact that, the, his opinion, 
that maybe in southern Europe they were about to go over the waterfalls with some extremely damaging implications for social welfare systems and the sustainability of society. Whereas in northern Europe they would muddle along and then he didn't know what to say about Germany either. Um, no, that's, that's very true. It, it's hard to know what to say about that. But um, uh, what he didn't do is he didn't go and look at the origins or attempt to sort out some of the factors that are actually in play here. And as you see in, in many of the things I've said, those factors are actually quite deep and quite enduring in societies. And they make us look at very long-run differences in the way societies work in these countries. And if that's the case, uh, basically what we will be doing, I would be doing is giving a basis of argumentation for precisely the type of conclusion that Kohler uh, had. Um, uh, those divergent scenarios could certainly be cause for concern. Anyway, wrapping it up, there's also implication here for policy, very much implication for policy, because so often policies, especially family-oriented policies, are based on the most superficial way of looking at the differences in Europe. They want to give a subsidy of the income or whatever. You know, they're all done in a very simple way. And if indeed my explanation that the way people live there, the society they're in, is important, it would make us have to rethink policy in a very important way and uh, in a very difficult way. I think that's important. And of course all of this will have very important implications for aging. Not only for the pace of aging, which will be of course much faster and much more precipitous in, in the southern and eastern <coughs> part of, uh, of, um, of, of, of Europe, as opposed to places like the United States, but also in the way society will be able to meet those challenges. Uh, because it's not so clear that the family itself, which is itself subject to an aging process, will be able to fulfill its traditional role, which was traditionally a role that's shored up the public role in, in societies in Southern Europe, but the family is going to be undergoing great, great changes, and it's not so clear that they will be able to do that in the future, or that they will not be damaged by, by the whole move towards, towards aging. In any case, uh, we are in for a roller coaster ride if the differences uh, persist in, in Europe. Anyway, thank you very much. Absolutely. That's exactly what I'm saying. And I, I would like to qualify it, if you'll allow me, before you finish what you're going to say, allow me to qualify it. I don't mean to say that societies are nicer and more pleasant in the, in, in the individualistic. Societies are nicer and more pleasant. Not at all. Societies are very rough. They're rough-edged. They're difficult. Suicides are high. Social exclusion is high. There's lots and lots of very big problems of societies in, in, in individualistic societies. It's all I'm saying is it looks like they have the instruments that make them more sustainable, at least from a demographic standpoint. They have, but, yeah. But then if one wants to go on and uh, write the next chapter, The Ways of Paradox, uh, why should it be that a strong family system, which must be strong because over dozens, hundreds of generations, it has reproduced itself, thinking of these as cultural entities subject to their own mutation and selection. Family systems have reproduced themselves. Why should strong family systems then find themselves weak in being able to reproduce themselves as a system. Mm -hmm. Why should the values turn against themselves? Do you have a kind of meta-story 
Well, my, my story is I think the fault is all the demographic transition. I, I think what the demographic transition is, it took away the underpinnings of a very convincing type of argument, which you're saying, which has lasted for centuries, which I agree with you completely. Um, uh, it, and, and what the demographic transition, it says, it, it took away the underpinnings of especially the role of mortality in determining people's uh, uh, reproductive choices, but that's the demographic reason, but the demographic transition didn't just go with the demographic changes, it also added to the mix, it added cultural revolution, it added synthetic contraception, it added all kinds of other things which happened to the climax of the demographic transition, which would be in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, coincides precisely with all of these other Okay, so change. So that, there, can we go in? I may take one more minute. That what what you're saying is that the traditional strong family systems were an adaptation to stress and external mortality, mm -hmm. and that adaptation becomes counterproductive when the external stress is gone, that's what it was the adaptation to. And so in biology there's a lot of talk about across species and biodemocracy about how high uh, external exogenous mortality then favors investments in shorter uh, lifespans, earlier reproduction, all kinds of, of things of that kind that you can and as you remove the uh, mortality impact, you then increase the rate of returns to investment in the future. Well, if you put your paradox into that framework, you can say that what you're calling individualistic societies are also societies <coughs> that invest substantially in uh, increased returns in later life. And so one could put the story that you're putting into a kind of biodemographic framework. Very interesting. Does this yes. make any sense? Yes, it makes, it makes very much sense. Uh, uh, if you look at these societies, the increases in ed education, well, the starting levels of education in individualistic societies was always higher than it was in in familistic societies in Europe. We can look at that as far back as the 18th century, early 19th century. You can see that fairly clearly. Especially the familistic societies, education was lowest among women. You get a very great disparity uh, by sex in, in terms of educational levels. You did not get those disparities uh, in, in, say, the UK or in Sweden or the United States. There was some disparity, but there certainly wasn't tremendous disparities. But yet the changes, the great modern increase in education starts, I, I think, way back in the 19th century, early 20th century. If you look at educational levels in the United States, in, in then, well, the United States in, in 1900 is far away better than any of the other countries in Europe. They're, they're far higher educational levels, but the other countries catch up fairly soon. In the strong family areas of Europe, the great boom in education, um, at least among women, doesn't start until the 1960s or 1970s. It starts actually much, much later. And that would fit into your idea of the investments in, in human capital, which would then have returns. Yes, that, that does sound. Yes, Josh? Uh, you uh, you uh, still uh, out the word, sir? Uh, 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 you can call on people. You okay, yeah. Um, I want to approach this from a supply and demand framework. I think that you, you think that the core of your argument, as I understand it, is that the supply of children in familistic societies is going to be lower than in individualistic societies, and but that we've only been able to observe the difference since the reduction of infant mortality. Mm -hmm. That somehow before that everything was pressed up out of necessity, as it were, some kind of reproductive necessity, to be very similar, so the, the difference is obscured. And now that that, as it were, that uh, uh, mm -hmm. prop 
to fertility has been removed, and we see a difference that reflects a structural difference in the very nature of these societies going back very far. And you keep talking about the 18th or 19th century, but it seems to me that you can take these back to the late Middle Ages. Probably. Absolutely. Uh, but then there is the demand for children, and here I'm not so clear. You had a slide that suggested that you were addressing this issue, but here I'm not so clear about a distinction. Uh, um, if if you ask people, uh, and, and, and demographers do, uh, uh, you know, uh, what's your desired family size? Are they fundamentally different in these? Society. No, everywhere you get desired family size around two. Yeah, right. <laughs> At least nowadays, so, everybody says okay. that. Okay, so so if 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 that's the case, then and then this gets to the the last slide here about implication for policy. Um, um, it seems to me, if you say, well, the policy change has to be to fundamentally change the nature of animalistic societies, then we have that's a tall order. <clears throat> uh, we have this have a lot of Swedish teachers in Spain <laughs> in whole new generations of students and things like that. So, um, but, so why wouldn't uh, a few tweaks to the most uh, you know, the significant impediments uh, that affect uh, you know, achieving your desired fertility uh, make a big difference? Well, the, the, um, they have been tweaking in Southern Europe for the last 30 years. Yeah. Every government implements a new sort of family policy, uh, pro-fertility policy, and they never seem to make much of a difference. And so the question is, why don't they make that much of a difference? And I think that it's because even though if, they, if you give you money to have children, that's really nice, your decision to have children is a really big decision in your life. And and it just seems to be more difficult for people in certain parts of the world than it is for other people. It just, it's a more difficult decision to make. And if that's the case, um, uh, so what if they give you, you know, a thousand dollars in tax rebate or something like that? You know what I mean? It, well, it doesn't really matter because I'm going to have that kid. Oh, by the way, one of the things I didn't show, agent leaving home. In, in, in the strong family areas of Europe is now close to 30, 29, 30. Uh, whereas in, in, in the United States, what is agent leaving? Well, we have the semi-agent leaving home. When you go away to college and your parents pay your tuition. But basically, very, people are out of the nest very early on, which means children are a big durable goods and they're durable for the family itself. Which is in, in itself a disincentive to durable in the bad sense that they're always hanging around. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then they and then they go off and then they then they get divorced and they come back. Yeah, right. I mean, there's no there's there's actually there was a novel going around the, uh, uh, in the country how to get rid of your your kids. I mean, how to get them out of the house, you know, because they don't they refuse to leave, and and that is in itself a disincentive. It's a dis the parents. Well, it's difficult for the parents and for the kids. It's a great disincentive not to have kids because if I have kids, I'm going to have them around until they're 35. You know, and, and so... Yeah, but, that, but, even, but, but the desired family size is still two. It's still two, yeah. but, but I don't know actually what that means in terms of surveys. We were talking about in class last week, you know, what does desired family mean? Uh, because I think the proper question, which of course is unanswerable, would be, what are you willing to sacrifice to have a desired family size? Are you willing to put up with a less than ideal partner? Are you willing to go three niches down in living standards, which we all did, when, at least I did. I'm sure most of us old folks here did that when we first started having kids. You know, are you willing, and I think the answer might be different. Yeah, but I mean, this last point gets back to the, sort of the, the irony that Ken just referred to, that uh, they, uh, what it takes to uh, what you, what you need in order to uh, to actually act on your desired family size is much greater in familistic societies that value the family uh, than in individualistic societies where presumably um, all kinds of factors desires uh, crowd in that are not necessarily conducive to to raising families. Absolutely, yeah. but you know you you get of course you get those factors that are not conducive, but yet. People take on that 
challenge uh, in a very natural way here, although fertility is also low here, but it, it's seemingly a very natural way. It's not a big deal. Uh, young folks in Europe, are, in Southern Europe, are scared. I mean, they won't admit they're scared. Yeah. You know, but you can tell they're scared. They're scared of relationships with, with, you know, and they're they're scared of having kids. They don't want to go through declining living standards. There's all kinds of things there that now that is of course very sharp it's a very sharp different difficult distinction nowadays d during a period of severe economic recession but the interesting thing is that fertility was also much lower in the heyday of the economic boom of 2005 and also the booms of the 1980s it's always been lower and that's that is something that it's a, you know, in, this, in a paper I, I wrote about childlessness, and I compared it to a very recent paper in the United States about childlessness, it turns out that the percentage of childless women uh, from very early on, from the cohorts born in the 1930s, uh, is, is significantly higher in Spain than it is in the States in all different times. You know, why is that? Anyway. Uh, now, about it in Spain, I would think about the massive redistribution of population from about 1950 forwards, and where the grandmas are. Okay. Ah, oh, that's very important. I know you folks in, in this wonderful wheat family area of the United States probably don't even know what the grandfather, grandmother effect is, or grandparent effect is, but it's that you have duties as grandmother, being a grandmother, yeah, but some people... And so you find that separated women or divorced women, there's, there's statistical studies that show but that they tend to either live with or nearby their mothers who take on that role. That's very, it's a very typical thing. I do that too. I have to show that men can also do that in Spain. So I take care of my granddaughters too. I picked them up at school twice a week. Anyway, yes? So I find your central point that uh, societies matter and um, making childbearing easier or not as easy, very convincing. Um, given that point, I wonder why the typology splits between individualistic and familistic when maybe it's kind of the, uh, the local or the national state apparatus that kind of allows for easier or harder childbearing situations is the more kind of operative component. Um, which makes me wonder if, in fact, individualism and familism as values are derivative of the different types of kind of states within which they're subsumed, such so that uh, the particular economic and economic conditions kind of in a particular nation allow or maybe even promote kind of individualism above and beyond kind of um, strong ties to families. And this might also be related to things to do with like corruption. So in a more corrupt state, um, it makes sense to kind of find alliances within families because they're trustworthy and you know you, you can you, you don't have to put as much trust in strangers at that uh, extent. So if you were to divide between kind of different types of state or different kind of governmental situations which make it easier to have, have children. Versus not. I wonder if that. Well, okay, now we obviously have different perspectives on this. I consider that the very nature of the state derives from something that was earlier than the state, which is the way the family and the individual interact to create society. And I find that uh, efficient government, a responsible government, the whole idea of governance is you look at a map of that. I mean, if we could, there are all kinds of statistics in Europe, we could look at it, you would find that it very much plays out in the strong and weak family um, uh, map I was saying before. Uh, I, think, I think the whole attitude towards corruption, I think it is not a, 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 a ha it's not by chance that the mafia was Italian and was structured along family lines you know, I, it, it, whereas you don't get that sort of thing. In other words, I think there are a lot of things that suggest that these basic identifications 
come earlier. It's I, I have a, I have down below in this a a, a graph of of the corruption index using uh, perceived corruption, and it, and it fits exactly the way fertility goes. Right, exactly, approximately the way fertility goes. You you you, you get the societies perceived as corrupt are are societies in the south and in the eastern part of Europe. They're not in the northern. The United States, we have many corrupt people in the United States, but I don't think anybody perceives the, the, the society as a fundamentally corrupt. It, that's something that is, has to be weeded out. In other words, corruption is something that's a human frailty that society has to weed out. You get the impression in Southern and Eastern Europe that it's just the opposite. Um, I, I think Josh did, did get it. So I'm kind of imagining the world if we saw high fertility in the southern countries and low fertility in the north. And I guess I would say, oh, that's because these are familialistic societies where all generations pitch in and people are very well insulated against all the buffets of modernity. Um, and I would expect people to marry young and the parents get you know, a lot of intergenerational support coming through. So. Uh, I guess there are two kind of points that, that I would make from that. One, one is that one has to explain how this plays out on fertility per se. Why is it, what's special about fertility that is making it not the case that people are getting resources from their, from the grandparents and insulated from everything. And the other perspective I think is that what's going on in these societies is that the capacity of families to take care of their children and grandchildren is disappearing. So it's kind of the, 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 the it, it's set up for family supports, but those family supports are being removed. So the grandparents can't provide housing for their children, maybe because of spatial dislocation, they can't provide care, they don't have wealth. These are countries where the, the elderly are not rich uh, compared to the, the standard of living in society. There's been rapid economic growth. So it seems to me maybe this is a story about the, uh, the destruction of this family support system in these strong family societies. And obviously there hasn't been a civil society to emerge so quickly. So you think it's just perhaps, in theory, just a matter of time before um, fertility and... Well, actually, the strong family per se doesn't seem to me, if the strong family weren't in place, then I would expect people to be marrying early, to get a lot of parental, uh, grandparental help with everything. They do get uh, lots of grandparental help. Yeah. There's a lot of, by the way, in what you said, their ability to give the help. You certainly are right in the, in, the, in the sense that it's increasingly difficult, but you're not right in, in the sense that there's a lack of willingness. There's very much a willingness to provide help. You see in the great crisis of the, um, of, of the last 10 years, in, in Southern Europe, you find the grandparents who are getting pensions are taking into their homes their children with children who lost their jobs and got thrown out and they were unable to pay their mortgages. Not what percentage of population is doing this, I don't know, but a very large percentage is. It's a very significant. They are doing their very best. Parents keep their kids at home longer because they say, the mother says, it's always the mother. Oh, honey, you don't want a low-paying job. Wait and save up. Stay with us. You can go out with whoever you want. Stay with us, and then you'll go out. Now, but the problem with that is that that dis is a disincentive for people making choices, for people becoming adults, for people being independent. And basically, I think the argument I'm making is if you don't feel, in this post-transitional world, if you don't feel independent and autonomous, and you have confidence in what you're able to do, you are, it is harder for you to make that decision that I can provide for my family, and I can offer them a life that's just as good as mine, or better if possible, and which is, uh, I think, essential well, when you why, want. Why isn't the script, oh, I'm not independent yet, but I don't need to be independent, so I'm going to go ahead and, and have a partner and have children because my family is going to help me out. Why isn't that They don't have children. But, but, but have. given the context, the cultural context, why it seems to me that would be an equally plausible outcome. Well, it's not one that's happened so far. 
Um, can't have another question. No, no. Take oh, the others. Sorry. Please. Um, um, my quick question is, what happens when you leave Europe? And it seems to me that if you go to other regions of the world, you can have a lot of these criteria that you have in the family listed, and you do have slow down transition and higher fertility. I think that's a very interesting question, which I don't even dare to <laughs> fool around with. But it is very interesting that the East Asian countries that are very much feminist societies, who, that have gone through their demographic transition, now have rock bottom fertility right. rates. And then you go to the Middle East and South Asia, you, you have feminist and still fairly solid fertility decline. Well, it's, it's coming down very quickly. We don't know where it's going to settle, but yeah. But yes, I, I think the arguments, if I could make them convincing for a Berkeley audience, um, could very easily be applied to other countries with the different time frames. Certainly could be applied to different areas. Right. Well, one way to, to do a sort of experiment would be to take people from these different regions and put them in the same economic and civil context which we do through migration, certainly. So I'm wondering what differential fertility of recent immigrants from Southern Europe and Northern Europe, for example, looks like in the US. That's very interesting. The, um, a, um, well, we, it's well known in the States that fertility of Mexican immigrants, recent Mexican immigrants, is higher than fertility back in Mexico which is a very big anomaly, anomaly on, the, on the international stage, because normally what you get is you get, from your country of origin, you get a lowering of fertility, at least if the country is a, a less developed area. You get a lowering of fertility, but you do get that. There is a, um, uh, we were, were working on a, on a paper about family systems in Latin America, and it turns out if you look at the importance of this, of, of, extended families in Mexico and in the States, of course it's far higher in Mexico than it is in the, in the States, but if you look at Mexicans in the United States, people of Mexican origins using the 1970 census, it turns out it's halfway between. It's certainly, it's higher than, than the white uh, American population, but it's lower than the Mexican population. And, and in time, the United States over a period of time, there's a period of acculturation where the, the, the characteristics of origin end up becoming irrelevant or becoming very less, much less, less important. And that's why, that's what helps me talk about the United States very much out in the upper right hand side of the graph and as a very staunchly individualistic society. Certainly the individualism does not come from the Latin American residents in the United States. It does not come from the Japanese or the Chinese people of Japanese or Chinese origin. It doesn't come at all. It comes from the people of, 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 the, of English origin. It comes from people of Northern Europe. Uh, yet the United States has done that. But the United States has benefited from a very long period of stability and very long processes. You can see you can see this, this uh, the way migrants are changed by the, by the whole society. And if you give them time, one, I don't know how much time, two generations, it practically disappears completely. Other questions? Yes? Uh, I want to follow Josh's point. So, since there is a tension between the individual choices and the family, desires to have children. So is there any change like on individual values that they want to adapt some values from individualistic society in this country, feministic societies? So is it like you mentioned they're evaluating the opportunity cost for to have a children, um, but they decide not to. So it sounds like a rational choice in you know, individualistic society. So Certainly it's rational choice everywhere. But my point is not that there's rational choice in some areas and not in others. Every place, is, but, the, but the way the rational choice plays out in one type of society is different from the way the rational choice plays out in another type of society. That's, 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 that's the point. It's certainly always an element of, of, of rational choice. So 
So I was wondering, is there a change in this feministic society? Like young people pursue the values in the individual. You certainly see lots and lots and lots of changes. The problem with an argument like mine is it's a very kind of overarching, long-term thing. It's very difficult to see short-term changes in it. You need more time. Perhaps Josh is right. I would be willing, since I can estimate life, my life expectancy, Josh, I'll bet you $1,000 and in 20 years we'll meet back here in Berkeley and see, you know, see, see if I'm right. But actually, 20 years is really not much of a time either, uh, time frame. See it's, it's, of it's one of the things going on is pe people, uh, a 30 year old in Spain has their parents so doesn't need children, whereas a 30 year old in Sweden doesn't have their parents and so needs children. Is it kind of a substitution of family ties and warmth and connection? Hmm. The, the, it's very interesting that normally uh, Swedish parents, when they're elderly, never see their children. They're oh, they're all over the place, and they might see them occasionally. Uh, but, and by the way, that's what the children expect. That's what the parents expect. They don't want to see them. They've done their job with the children, and it's nice to have them, and you see them occasionally. But your life is for years. And that's why you get such a wonderful attitude towards aging among people there. They're, they're autonomous much longer. They read. They're in groups of this and that, you know, that sort of thing. In in um, uh, in Southern Europe, uh, no, no, not at all. You see your grandparents all. You have lunch with them every Sunday with your parents. Okay. And if you don't, there's something wrong. And your mom will call you and tell you what's wrong with you. <laughs> you know, that's that. It's not. It's not given. It's not. It's you're expected to have that sort of thing. Now, not everybody has it to the same degree as other people, of course. But yes. But I mean, are these are they substituting in some sense? That because you have your parents, you don't need children, and it's but that, what you need is I, I haven't thought of it in those terms. Uh, I, I think the expectations of a young Swede or a young American is my future and everything is the family I have that has me as a father or mother, and that's where I'm laying my eggs. And my parents will be there, you know, I'm sure. I'm not saying we don't love our parents. Everybody loves their parents. You know, that's not the point. But the idea is, it's me, it's my challenge in life to do that and have, have my children. Whereas you spend more time being beholden to your family, but that's, they're, they're back in the same strong family, weak family. Liddy Bachi once wrote a, an article, um, he called it, about the family in Italy, called it Too Much Family, Too, too Few Children, I think was the name of the article. Because uh, he looked at that kind of conundrum, that how can you have such a family oriented culture and yet have such low fertility. And he came up with the idea, not completely dissimilar to what, what I'm saying, that, that um, you're, you're, this choice that you need to make to become an adult, to be on your own, to have your job, to find your, your woman or, or man, to have kids or not, which is so important, it, it ends up just kind of being put on the back burner. It'll happen eventually happen eventually and you get older and you get older and you get, you know, that sort of thing. And um, that I think is important. But then, of course, when you're a young person, this is my argument basically, when you're a young person, if you don't look at life as a plain, as an even playing field, that's a disincentive of having children too. And, and people in strong family areas of Europe never look at uh, getting along in life as an even playing field. It's got to be who you know. And the way you know who you know is through your family. Okay, let's stop here. We're at 20 past. The second rare paradox the shorter your talk, the longer the discussion. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. Thank you very much.